I think like most artists, we all start off as most children do, uh, thinking that this, this is fun. I've got crayons, I've got pencil, I've got paper, and in kindergarten, there was a teacher that said she liked something that I had drawn. Okay, so this, this gets into your head. Somebody appreciates something that you're doing. I look back now, it's just like every other child in kindergarten. But, for instance, uh, uh, it stuck with me. So from there, uh, I'd always had an interest in, in producing art. Yeah, under the tutelage of Mr. Garrett White, who was new to teaching at the time, and, and I was a freshman at uh, Dunbar Vocational High School, I, I think the, the year he started. So uh, the people that I met then had been become people that I refer to for the rest of my life as the, the beginning of my uh, seriousness in, in art. I wanted to be uh, a well-known illustrator at the time, everybody, I uh, think, starts off that way. You see nice pictures, even uh, the characters in comic books and stuff like that. But I wanted to become an illustrator and make a lot of money in commercial art. It didn't happen. <laughs> but I did have uh, a brief career in commercial art. As a matter of fact, I started, this is after having been uh, drafted into the Army. I came out and uh, got a job as an apprentice, I'm one of the oldest apprentices in the city. I was 25, 26 years old, but I did that in order to, be, uh, to get in the business. And then I found a freelance job with Afro AM, uh, and they actually put me onto a job at the uh, SVE, the Society for Visual Education, where. I was an illustrator uh, doing film strips. After that, it turns out that I, I found my way into teaching. Okay, I was doing freelance work for Johnson Publication, and uh, I was told that the job at Dunbar was open. So I went back home to Dunbar and taught there for 22 years. Okay, and I have, uh, I'm beginning to see some of the payoff now, uh, 15 years after I've retired, that uh, some of uh, the people are mature, grown up, and uh, have been in touch with me. And, and I'm glad to see that, because you don't know what, what's going on about the future of, of some of these young people until after they've grown up and come back. Okay, let me start with a few names. Uh, there's Jeff Downson, Wadsworth Jarrell, Jay Jarrell, Barbara uh, Jones, and uh, Gerald Williams. I think they were the original five, and I don't know if all of them, but some of them actually worked on the Wall of Respect. Now, they were uh, in touch with the uh, the Renaissance movement in the arts. Obase, the AACM, and uh, Africobra was an idea amongst those original five people. Oh, I, I could be wrong about who was the original five because there's uh, Nelson uh, Stevens and Napoleon Henderson. I'm not sure who were the original five because I was one of the last two. <laughs> but uh, they had already formed this idea about uh, the philosophy and, and the focus of what Afro-Cobra should be. Even the name Afro-Cobra, I think uh, by the time I got in there, they had already decided on the name. They had decided on the principles and, and, and what the focus will be about positive imagery, uh, putting out a, a good uh, sense of who we were. Uh, this is not to eschew the establishment because a lot of us had trained, uh, you know, formal, formal trained here and there, but uh, we want to speak with our own voice. Uh, so I can remember sitting around and uh, 
I was more of a listener, but I, I made some contributions. But I remember uh, how the idea about focusing on, on color, focusing on uh, uh, making statements rather than just creating pictures, making statements with our art and, and addressing uh, things, pretty much what a lot of young people, progressive young people, today are doing. I think everybody in their own time, uh, there, there's a few that are going to go against what is established as the norm, so to say, because the norm is not really normal. <laughs> the norm is not really normal. It's, it's, uh, the, the, the norm is a convenient thing for uh, for whatever the larger society uh, finds uh, to exploit, so to say. So we were going against uh, the norm. We wanted to make a statement based on what we felt was needed for us and for our community. So that, that's, uh, that's what I remember sitting around talking about. I was glad to be a part of something that uh, where I was included into something that I thought was uh, going to be important. I don't know, I didn't know how important or when any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, emphasis coming back to us would, would happen. I didn't, I don't even know if I perceived that that would happen. Uh, the idea was that here was a group that I was comfortable with and privilege to be a part of. And I can remember the person who invited me in was Jeff Donaldson. I met him somewhere and I don't know where. <laughs> he saw something that I did and I don't know what it was, but he thought it was good enough to invite me to come see what they were doing. And so we used to meet at Wadsworth's house. And uh, all of these things started happening from there. You know, the Wall of Respect represents a grassroots effort to make a statement. Uh, I can remember, see, I had just gotten out of the Army uh, in 1966. And when I found a real place to live, it was in this area somewhere. And I would go to the beach and, and hear the AACM free concerts. I just found myself, this is, this is the beginning of what heaven should be for somebody coming of age. And uh, like I said, this was part of the Renaissance movement. Sam Greenlee's book turned into a movie somewhere in that same period. And he come out of the Obasi movement. Uh, Afrikobra, we had several of the founders of Afrikobra that participated in that wall of respect. And when I saw it, and remember the biggest figure in the world, uh, in terms of visibility, was Muhammad Ali. And he has center stage on that wall with his arms raised. So uh, when I saw that and, and all the other people on the, on the wall, I thought that, I thought the wall of respect was one of the more phenomenal things the visual artists could do. And I was very disappointed when uh, there's only photographs left. The building's torn down or, or whatever. But uh, it started the mural movement here in Chicago. Okay. Right. Uh, restarted uh, uh, mural movement. I mean, murals have been around for forever. But uh, on, in the general public, you didn't see a lot, a lot of that until after that wall of respect. You know, I, I can't say that people outside of this general area and on down to 43rd, I don't know how many people outside this area uh, would come down just to see the wall of respect. I mean, it's just a picture on the wall for a lot of people. Okay, but for the people in the neighborhood, this was our thing. This was ours. And, and the artists uh, may have come from far and wide uh, to participate, much like the uh, artists doing the Bronzeville photo. Uh, but. I can't say people from the west side and the far south uh, that weren't involved in the art would come down and look at the wall. 